This is Anthony Anarino, and you're listening to In the Arena. Yes, here we go again. So I'm back from South Africa. I spoke twice there, managed to get a severe cold, a sinus infection, and lose my voice, and then came back to Columbus and managed to get bitten by some sort of a spider or insect. So it feels like I have a gunshot wound through my right shoulder. But here I am, I'm back again, this time with a friend of mine. I have a tribe on uh, the web that I was invited into some time ago. And that tribe has grown. There's now 30 or 40 of us that all write and coach and consult and speak about sales. And today, we're going to talk to a friend of mine, Kelly Riggs. And Kelly has written a new book called Quit Whining and Start Selling. And I like this book, and I'm going to talk about some of this throughout my conversation with Kelly because it's a fundamentals book. So this is a book that you can pick it up, you can dive into any kind of section that appeals to what you're working on right now, and you can find answers just like that. And that, to me, is the value of a book. Do I know how to apply it? Can I go and take something from this and start working right now? Kelly is a great dude. I'll put some links to his stuff at the end of this. And here we go with my friend, Kelly Riggs, from my sales tribe. Hey, Kelly. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Okay, so this will be the first time I've introduced you to my community outside of retweeting and reposting some of the things that you've written. So can you give people just a quick intro to who you are and what you do? Well, I'm starting my seventh year, Anthony, as a consultant. I I suspect many ways just like you, uh, clients all over the country, although I understand you're international as well, but uh, deal with a variety of clients, a variety of different sizes and industries and those kinds of things. What I do is uh, focus on three things. I, I really started out in, in management leadership and helping management teams become more effective as leaders, and that uh, sprung out of my background as a sales manager. And the second thing that I do, and, and it is really where I think I would have started if I was mapping my career, is I teach sales, just like you do, to, to both salespeople and sales managers, sales executives across the country, uh, because I've got three decades of sales experience, and of course, that's where the book comes from as well. The third thing I do is strategic planning, which, as you know, is is an integral part of the sales process as well. So that's a little bit on my background. Okay, so mostly consulting. Yes, consulting and training. Okay. And uh, your book is called Stop whining and start selling. So I want to start with whining, if that's okay with you. Um, sure. Actually, actually, you started. It, well, it's, it's actually okay. quit whining and start selling. Oh, and whining. I say right. that because many years ago, I found out there is a book called Stop Whining, Start Selling. There's no and. It doesn't start with quit. But <laughs> Otherwise, the distinction wouldn't matter at all. Okay. Well, we'll quit whining. Well, let's start with whining anyway. You bet. Salespeople make excuses, and uh, you've got a list of them. What? Why do salespeople make these excuses, and what do you tell them? You've got a one-to-one principle that you end each chapter with. What? Why should they quit whining? Well, whining is counterproductive. First of all, you know the reality is is when we're waiting on others to create create our success, we'll be waiting a long time. Uh, but it, it's just natural, I think. You know, people, when they fail or when they don't enjoy the success that uh, they think they should, typically look for scapegoats elsewhere. Uh, it's it's someone else's fault or it's our product's fault. It's the marketing we the company doesn't do or my territory is not big enough or, uh, you know, we're not competitive or my price is too too high or something of that nature. But, uh, but there's a recession, Kelly. Well, exactly. It's always the economy. And one of the fun things I like to say is, you know, when we get a deal, it's because we're really good at what we do. But when we lose a deal, it's because of the economy. Exactly. Or my customer yeah. bought on price. Exactly right. Uh, and, and there's just never a shortage of excuses to go around. But I think the, the first step in becoming 
uh, a superstar or a high performance player in, in anything is to first take on that mantra that, listen, if I'm going to be successful, it's going to be up to me and I'm going to have to overcome these barriers because the reality is it impact everybody, not just me. That's right. And what's your, what's your one-to-one principle? Well, the, the one-to-one principle is victims make terrible salespeople, you, you know, especially if you're going to be a superstar. So you need to set aside the victimhood, uh, the victim uh, mentality, and, and instead decide to plan your way into success. Find, find the route that will take you there, uh, build a roadmap to get there, and, and then do the very best that you can to follow it, making adjustments along the way. What's funny about that is I've been uh, speaking, and I have a, a, a number of slides in the deck uh, that show the economic recession that we had in 2009, you know, really started at the end of 2008. But we went from $14.3 trillion GDP to $14 trillion GDP and then immediately bounced, you know, right back up over 14.3 again the following year. But I think that people's mentality continued on that downward slope, like we were continuing to sink, sink further and further into a a deeper and deeper recession, but the fact of the matter is we're 15 and now closing in on a $16 trillion economy. But I think the mentality out there is it's still tough, and and people still believe that they're a victim, even though a $14 trillion economy means that there's a lot of things being bought and sold and moved, right? Oh, no question about it. You know, it's interesting. I do deal in a couple of industries that were really impacted by the recession, and, and the, the prime one being a commercial construction. But I, it's still, you can get over that hurdle mentally when you recognize that unless your, your, your market share is ridiculous, there is still an enormous amount of business activity, which your numbers show you directly. So even though the pie is getting smaller, there's plenty of pie out there, and most industries were not anywhere near as impacted as the construction industry. So it, it, it really is just a convenient excuse. Sure, there's, there's a few less dollars being spent, no doubt, but you've spent that you uh, spread that $300 billion over all of uh, the throughput in, in American economy, it really turns out to be pretty small in, in each and every market sector that we would deal with. It just feels bigger than it is, and then suddenly it makes, again, it makes a great excuse. Yeah, one of my businesses dropped 40% the day that that happened, you know, and the only only real answer you have is uh, sell your way through it. I mean, you you don't have any other choice anyway, so you might as well stop being a victim and get selling. Okay, so there's two two sales being made. Uh, I'm the customer, and either you're selling me or I'm selling you. So wh- how do how do prospective clients try to sell you on price? Um, and and answer this as a follow up question: Do they really want the lowest price? Well, the, I'll let me answer your second question first. Uh, they will do everything to make you believe that they do, but clearly they do not because there. <laughs> There are so many things that are important to a buyer fundamentally. They still have to have the product delivered and serviced and maintained. Uh, you know, they need training. They need follow-up. They need repeat uh, deliveries. There, there's a dozen and one things that truly are important to people. However, anybody who buys anything, you and I included, I suspect, when we decide what we want, don't we still try to get the very best price that we can? Which means that even when I've decided you're the best choice, for the product or service that I want to buy, I'm still going to try to get the best price, which means every sales presentation somewhere in it has an objection to your price. Uh, the question is, who's doing a better job of selling whom? Is the customer selling you better than you're selling them? Or have you delivered enough value in the sales presentation that when they say, hey, Anthony, how about a lower price? You say, you know, I understand how you feel. I, I, when I'm a consumer, I'd love to give a, have a lower price. But Let's go back and talk about the things that you're trading for that price. There, there's a great quote by Roy Williams that says, you know, the, the thing will never happen until what you're offering in terms of value exceeds the money that they have in their pocket. Um, but once they become convinced that the value is there for the price, the price really is not nearly as significant as we as salespeople tend to think it is. That's it's so true. And, you know, they have to perceive – that what they're buying is worth more than the money they're spending. And until you can increase that perception, uh, they're going to ask for a lower price. And, you know, ultimately, I tell salespeople this all the time, they're obligated to ask you for a lower price, right? They have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. And if they don't ask, they're not doing their job. And and I think one of the reasons they 
always ask so religiously is because as salespeople, we've trained them so well that if they ask, we say yes. So why wouldn't you ask if every time you ask, somebody says yes, you're obligated? Yes, absolutely correct. You know, in a perfect world, every single product is absolutely feature for feature, service for service, company for company, identical. It comes down to price. But that is not true anywhere. I mean, I don't even believe in a commodity. Somebody still has to make sure that commodity can be delivered, it can be shipped, it can be stored, uh, you know, that it's in the right condition and all those kinds of things. But, Anthony, you, you deal with salespeople all over the country, all over the world. They're selling similar types of products, but you know that they're delivered in such different ways that there really are significant differences. And then there are differences between companies and the way they do business and, and the way they follow up on their products and the customer experience that they create. Each of those elements fundamentally alters the price. But salespeople get so focused on it because their world is they hear it every single day. Your price is too high. After a while, they start to believe it. I, I think that's the biggest sin that they're guilty of. So I think if once your perception becomes that your price is too high, it's very difficult for you to sell. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're the one that's with the price sensitivity now, not the client. That's right. I got a couple more questions for you right out of the book I want to ask you. So uh, why don't we do a better job qualifying? And, and why is it such a critical component to, to selling effectively and selling well? Well, the, the qualification process is about ensuring that you're spending the one asset you have as a salesperson in, in the most effective way. You know, we really deal in time and ideas. Salespeople, only, the, the only real thing that they have to work with is the time and the day, and so they have to get in front of as many qualified customers as they can during that time period. And by qualified, we mean uh, they have a high probability of buying from us. We know who the right people are that are going to make those decisions. Our solution meets their needs very clearly and offers additional value. They've got the funds available and several other qualifying factors. If, if we don't qualify people effectively, qualify those prospects that we have, we wind up using a lot of our most valuable commodity chasing deals that we may never, ever have a chance of getting. And, and it's, it's fundamentally a flaw, I think, for salespeople. Here's a great example. I go into a, an opportunity and it looks great. My product fits perfectly with them. We have a great relationship. And I sit down with the buyer and make a presentation. And uh, I get two-thirds of the way through it. And he says, you know, I've got a couple of partners that I really need to run this by and uh, make sure that we're on the same page. But everything looks good. Well, suddenly my sure thing is run off the rails because here's two partners who could be influenced by any number of other factors who, you know, now I'm relying on this customer to sell them for me instead of myself. So I scramble around and say, hey, well, what do we got to do to get your partners in the same room? Well, one of them's in uh, a different city and another one's out on vacation. And now the sales process begins to languish. We, and and I've, seen, I've seen sales go completely dead over the long haul because it, they just never wind up getting everybody on the same page. But some good homework on the front side would have revealed the fact uh, that there's multiple decision makers. And I would have made plans to not only try to get them in the same room, but to influence them along the way and make sure I understood their, their motivations for the purchase and all those various kinds of things. I think salespeople, uh, Anthony, to answer your first question, the reason they don't do that is, is typically one of two or three things. One is a lot, a lot of times we're just lazy. You know, we, we seek the straightest line to the, to the presentation because the presentation is where things happen. You know, we get in front of people and uh, I can really be good in front of a customer and I'm going to convince them that we have the right product or service for their needs. And so I shortcut some of those things. And the real, the real difference between the, the, the superstar professional sales guy and, and someone who's a little bit more average is that they do their homework well. They plan well. They prepare well. And they really understand what they're getting into long before they get into the presentation. I think the other thing is probably related to that, and, and that is that most people just enjoy the sales presentation far more than they prepare. The, they like the preparation and the other work. I and mean, that's hard work. It's not sexy, Anthony. I mean, come on, let's face it. Uh, the sales presentation is where you really, you know, the bright lights are. Uh, so let's just cut to the chase and, and get to the fun part of the deal. And they, they're successful enough to believe that that's true, uh, and, and then they don't face reality when they miss a sale. Again, they go back and say, well, it's just the economy or, or something else. So I, I think there's a sense in which 
the third aspect of it is is related to the first two as well. Sometimes salespeople just haven't been trained, and that's where they need people like yourself to come in and and help them understand that there is a process, a way of creating these steps towards a successful sale, and qualifying is just one of them. Yeah, I I think it's mostly that we're hungry. I mean, I think it's mostly just that we're hungry, so everything looks like a deal. If <laughs> if you point. need to make your number, so you know I'm. If you need your number and this person's willing to talk to you, it looks like an opportunity. It's qualified as right. far as I'm concerned, right? Right, absolutely. absolutely. But we do spend time and energy, and I, I like you know to think about qualifying as who can we really do the greatest amount of value creation for because those are the people that are under – they're going to understand our value proposition. They're going to admire what we do enough and respect what we do enough to be willing to pay for it and – they're going to be partner-minded and let us capture some of that value. And I think when when you get hungry and you start moving away from that, you start moving towards places where those things aren't true, where they don't really perceive value, where price starts to become more important, where they're going to be difficult to work with because they really don't uh, think of you as a partner or need you to be a partner at some level. And it gets harder and harder, I think, to capture value when it's hard to create it. And qualification is really where that starts. Yes, you absolutely. you either you either find people that that need what you really do, what you're great at, or you don't. Your your closing of the book though ends with um. You know, I'm still a relationships guy, and in my mind right now, the world that we live in is a world that's telling everyone that they absolutely have to be transactional, that they have to find a way to get to the lowest price, that all cost has to be driven out of all businesses, that people aren't willing to pay for more. And then you end talking about relationships. And I've I've written about this a number of times, and it's one of the, the foundational principles that I believe about sales. I do think that relationships matter as as much as anything, and I think all things being equal, relationships win. All things being unequal, relationships still probably win. And it, it's more, though, than it used to be. It's more than just we have to be friends. Uh, I still think no like, and trust matters, but you've got a list in the back of the book of all the important factors to relationships. What are some of those factors that that go to strong relationships and in, in maintaining those relationships in sales and in business? Well, I tell you, I think relationship is probably one of those words that's uh, w- one of the most misunderstood parts of the sales vocabulary that there is. You know, there m- most people believe that if they've, uh, you know, made a few calls on a customer and they've got their business card, they've traded a catalog and they've brought in donuts or had or played golf a couple of times or, or even bought a product or service from them, Anthony, they'll, they'll think, well, we've got a relationship. In, uh, in my mind, that, that's not true. Uh, you know, you, there are all levels of relationships in, in any kind of uh, interaction. You know, if you, you can just be dating someone or you can be married to someone. You can be acquaintances with someone or you can be deep friends with them. And I think sales is the same way. We tend to look at relationship as a singular word with one definition. But in my mind, a, re- a relationship really exists uh, first and foremost, if you've created a level of trust with somebody that they, they rely on you for solutions to, to other problems, they, they ask your opinion about things, um, that, that all that trust is built on a number of items. Uh, you know, they believe that you're helpful and that you provide value for them, uh, that you're responsive, that, you, you know, they can count on you in a pinch, that, that you bring more than just a product solution to the table. You bring ideas and application. Uh, they have confidence in you. They perceive less risk in dealing with you. In other words, that that uh, relationship, quote unquote, trans something uh, you know that's just superficial in nature. It's taken on a whole life of its own in terms of that trust factor. And once you get there, um, again, we talked about the whole price issue. The price issue becomes secondary. I didn't say unimportant, but it becomes secondary because then they're really hesitant to go with another vendor because they're not getting you and all that you bring to them as a part of that relationship. And I'm in your camp. I think in, in the final analysis, everything about it, uh, about the sales process, hinges on a good relationship. But it's not just in knowing someone. It's about what you bring to it in terms of value and trust and confidence and risk management, all of those things. 
Yeah, I'm calling them level four value creation, and, and I'm I'm referring to these as relationships of value. It's so it, it's it's more than we go play golf, although that can be part of it. I'm not saying that friendship yeah. at some level, and that we have this kind of relationship where uh, we're we're human and personal doesn't matter, but the other part of it matters too. And I mean, your list is a good list for salespeople to look at. It's way at the end of the book, uh, too. And it's about, you've got things on there like trusting the company, confidence, perception of risk, which I think so many salespeople underestimate uh, how much work they need to do in explaining the risk to their customers because they don't have the, the right perception. And understanding their business and their values and being easy to do business with. And all these things roll up into what your overall relationship looks like. And it's such an important picture. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, the, 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 the reality is, is that's the singular best way to overcome the price objection over the long term is that when, when someone understands exactly what they get from you, that uh, as a salesperson, they know that you care about their business, you understand it, you know how it works. Uh, they, they know that the risk with you is, is minimal. You're a proven entity. Uh, your company is easy to do business with. You remove those barriers. My point in the book is those things are worth something to a client. And I, it's over the course of my three-decade career, many, many times I have heard people say, you know, I could have gotten a lower price somewhere else, but I needed to go with you or I needed to go with the particular salesperson I was with because of these other things, you know, or one specific of those. People are willing to pay more, but the reality is, is, you know, purchasing departments got developed so that they could take the emotion out of the purchasing process and uh, and just create a price-based decision matrix, and that's just not reality in the, in the real world. Even as much as they try to do that, there's always going to be a background emotional content, some sort of motivation that people have for making a decision and it is, uh, my experience, I'm, I'm sure similar to yours, is 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not price. It's more about the person you're doing business with. I think that's still true. I had something that I bought, and my my old man, when I was talking to him about it, said, you know, you could have got that at a cheaper price. And I said, I didn't want it at a cheaper price. I wanted people to kill themselves to give me exactly what I wanted. And, Absolutely. You know, and it's worth paying more. In this case, it could because it was something that was going to make a statement about who I am and how I create value, and cheap wasn't, you know, one of the values that I was bringing to the project. Well, your book right. is fantastic, and I I said this to you I think before we hit record on this call. I'm a fundamentals guy, and so much of what you've written is sort of um, I'm going to call it a playbook. So you can you can dive in, and a chapter is two or three pages long, and the points are are very succinct and very easy to follow. But sort of if you've got a challenge, you can go in to the book and grab whatever you need from whatever section you're you're looking at and then go and run with that, which I think makes it a really, really useful book for salespeople and for sales managers. I, I have a feeling that the title is going to appeal to sales managers yeah. uh, particularly and as something that they want to hand to a salesperson. Um, where do people go to find more about you? Well, you can go to uh, my website, which is one on one selling. Dot com and those are using the number one one on one selling dot com and obviously you can find the book and uh, in soft cover version there in the, in my blog and other things of that nature of course we're on Twitter together I'm on Twitter at, at Kelly Riggs and uh, there is also the Kindle version which is available in the book you can find that at Amazon that's a simple Google search and you'll find it find it there as well I'll put links up thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Anthony, I appreciate it, man. I really appreciate it. You can find Kelly at oneononeselling.com, and that's the number one, oneononeselling.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Kelly Riggs. You can find me at thesalesblog.com. And when you show up there, do sign up for my newsletter. It's the best and most important content I produce each week. Until then, I will see you next week in the arena.